This is Duke University. So today what I'd like to discuss is how and why St. Julian the Hospitaller, a saint more beloved in folk Catholicism or among members of the general public than among counter-reformation bishops, how he came to speak now what? Does anyone remember some of the contours of this quite strange saint? Perhaps readers of Flaubert might remember or visitors to French cathedrals. He's the, um, he is, it's a hagiography um, that draws on Arthurian romance motifs, but also has echoes of the Oedipus legend. And in most versions of the story, a young man goes hunting, kills a stag whose entrails prophecy that he will kill his parents. So to avoid this fate, he flees, goes to a distant land, marries quite well, becomes the master of a castle. But of course, his parents look for him far and wide, finally reaching his home when he's away. His wife, overjoyed to meet her in-laws, invites them in, puts them in their bedroom. So when Julian comes back, as pictured here from the Rouen Cathedral that inspired Flaubert Saint-Julien, he suspects his wife of adultery and kills his parents. At that point, then, he spends the rest of his life aiding needly travelers. In many versions, he's ferrying them across a river. And so this becomes the, these become the deeds that confirm his sainthood. Now, this legend epitomized the kind of saint um, that church authorities after the Counter-Reformation sought to de-emphasize. But the story remained present, of course, in Europe. On stained glass, this is perhaps the most famous. There's also one in the Chartres Cathedral. In Spain, there's a pilgrim shelter in the western region of Samora. There's quite a devotion, small localized devotion in what is now the Basque region, but was in the 16th century Navarre in the town of Ogni. So that this story remained present. At some point in the mid, in the early 17th century, a quite successful playwright, Antonio Mira de Amescua, with his ear tuned to the demands of a notoriously exacting audience, adapted this for stage. And you can, as you read the play, The Animal Prophet and Fortunate Patricide, you can kind of see a, playwright, a working playwright's wheels turning, as if to say, a talking deer, um, this won't hold the audience for two hours, so I'm going to add a seduction plot. So he appends, the playwright appended a completely new seduction plot to Act One, in which Julian's hunting trip will coincide with an assignation he has arranged with a young woman who lives nearby. His lackey in the play is named Vulcan, delivers a letter inviting her to this secluded place. So that, of course, when the prophecy of patricide and flight comes about, there is also a woman where there's a strong implication in the playtext that she was seduced and abandoned. And I'll show you the language here. Um, he's saying to her, you know, give me your hand in a sign, you know, this, take, take, I will take your hand, take my hand, and they're exchanging. Um, she says, my hand and my heart is yours. And often in theatrical coding, there's a strong suggestion that there's a seduction that takes place, much as in sitcoms, you know, when the lights would go down. Um, there was an implication of sex. So what happens then is when he flees to avoid the deer's prophecy, the act one ends with the parents face to face with the soon to be abandoned lover who says, you know, God willing, may he kill you with cruel knife blows because his absence will kill me. So it adds this, this sort of echo of the curse of an abandoned woman to the prophecy of par patricide from the, from the stag he hunted. So what happens when this already unorthodox hagiography travels across the Atlantic to colonial Mexico and to a mostly rural mission setting? What happens when the seduction, abandonment, and prophecy replay in a setting, a colonial setting of a Jesuit mission that's in a part of the basin of Mexico where Nahuatl speakers and Nahuatl speakers and Otomi speakers outnumber Span native Spanish speakers. And just to get situate you there, here we have the um, famous Ortelius map of New Spain. And if you look towards the middle where you see the lake, 
if you go, where I've put an arrow, you see Tepozotlan, now part of the sort of megalopolis that is Mexico City, but then very much a place outside, outside the city center. Now, in the mid-17th century, Bartolomé de Alva Ixlilchochit, a beneficed priest working in close collaboration with a Jesuit mission there in Tepozotlan, translated the animal prophet though he attributed it to the most popular and well-known playwright of the day, Lope de Vega, and you can see that. This is a transcription from the surviving manuscript that's in Berkeley's Bancroft Library. It was quite common to misattribute plays to Lope de Vega because of his popularity. So I think, I think for example, Cornet did the same thing with um, La Verdad Sospechosa, that initially he attributed it to Lope de Vega. So it's quite a common error, and it certainly has a Lopean style. So he did this as part of a larger project focused on preparing Nahuatl versions of a small but representative sample of Spanish theater with relig on religious topics that could be useful in terms of doctrinal, confessional issues. So the obvious question would be what sparked this apparently singular literary experiment, or the only one we can document. And what we can ascertain from of evidence is that the foremost goal was to create study texts that would allow European priests to hone their skills in Nahuatl. This goal was crucial in light of the fact, given the top-down nature of the evangelization enterprise. So the official or the general policy throughout the Spanish monarchy, but also in the Portuguese empire, was that natives and even mestizos were typically excluded from ordination in the priesthood. In fact, Doriel Alden documents among, in the Portuguese world, Jesuits, even having a certain discrimination against Europeans who'd spent long years in what they considered outposts. So you can imagine that the, the communication problem in a, in a Catholic mission that this creates, European-born priests had to acquire sufficient native language proficiency to be able to give appealing sermons and hear confessions in the native language. And here, I think it also bears just providing some nuance to even in some very solid literary histories, when people talk about the so-called theater of evangelization, you will often see comments suggesting that this was a 16th century phenomenon with a strong assumption that the 17th century hispanization was sufficiently widespread so that you didn't need to have this, this sort of native language theater. But the demographic reality of 17th century Mexico meant that despite the devastating impact of epidemic disease and forced labor, the Amerindians accounted for some, an estimated 80% of the population of what was called New Spain or Mexico. And so with the general policy of excluding natives and even mestizos from ordination as priests, confessionalization was very asymmetrical, was very top down in terms of communication. So European priests, again, would hear confessions and preach in native languages. And to do so, how would they acquire the competence? Think, I think of myself trying to travel in rural Morocco with a Lonely Planet phrase book. And as soon as I can't figure out how to say what, in a non-French speaking rural area, how do you, what's the name of this town in French? How would you pronounce it? You, you know, once you get off of the script, you are, you have a very difficult time. <laughs> There is no evidence to suggest that these were intended for performance. It's something I did look in, in Jesuit archives even, looking for any indication that there was a performance context, in, performance intended, but we can't document this textually. That said, the, the mission there in Teposotlan was quite known in, er, in earlier decades for again, Ameri native Mexicans, they could be either Otomis or Nahuas who were very, who were undertaking very interesting work in liturgical music and also in religious theater. So it is a place that had precedence of theater and theatrical um, expressions of religious ideas. So it's entirely possible, and the plays certainly would have lent themselves to it. But what we can document is the use for language study. And we can also see this in the only other surviving work by this translator, Bartolomé de Alva Ixlilchochit, which is a bilingual confessional manual, his guide to confession, large and small, in the Mexican language, again in Nahuatl. 
and you can see the subtitle, and conversations against the superstitious idolatry that remains among the Indians today. And so it is quite, it's like European confessional manuals where it goes through the commandments and other issues and asks yes or no questions and then gives instructions. But reading it, you can see the limits of this kind of learning, sort of memorization of scripts, when you get to questions that could lend themselves to sort of vagueness. For example, there's a moment where the priest asks, do you keep some of the turquoise figures that your grandfathers had? And then if the, if the parishioner says yes, the priest is to give a long sort of scolding that says, you know, poor you, the devil has you trapped in the dark night of superstitious idolatry. So you can ask yourself how many, there were Italian and there were Spanish Jesuits in this mission. How many Italians and Spaniards or other Europeans could acquire that level of competence? And what do you do if the, if the response is ambiguous? You need more contextualized language learning. So this problem, evidence suggests, led Alvaix Lichocit to collaborate with the rector of the Jesuit mission, um, Florentine Horacio Carocci, who we know at this time was developing a system of contextualized language study designed to improve communication between priests of European origin and Nahuatl speaking parishioners. He was also at this time studying Otomi and he prepared a, a grammar of this entirely different language, which unfortunately is, is not available in print. Um, so the theater texts from Spain chosen for translation seem to have arrived to Alva in the context of a kind of scriptorium or place of study in which they were seeking all manners of speech to compile as integration into study aids. So as Alva prepared his translation of the St. Julian play that, I'll, that we're talking about, The Animal Prophet, Carocci was preparing his landmark Art of the Mexican Language, which is striking compared to earlier grammars of Nahuatl in that it insists on immersion in the culture in order to acquire competence. Now, those of you who have worked with Walter Mignolo's Darker Side of the Renaissance, and he discusses this really important text in very interesting ways, it is still profoundly colonial in its goals and in its framework. But what it does represent in terms of linguistic study is this crisis or this moment where, for example, this Florentine is taking stock of Nahuatl, recognizing that it is fully coeval with Latin, acknowledging even that it has complexities that you don't find in Latin, such as the reverential adverbs. So it is challenging Eurocentrism with evidence of this equally complex and rich language that he's studying in Mexico. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.